I am super excited to be here today. My name is Shantaria Charleston, and I am the Director of Technical Assistance and Training here at the Housing Assistance Council. And it is my honor and privilege to be here before you this morning to welcome you to HACS 2018 Rural Housing Conference. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that we've made a few um, adjustments to both our afternoon plenary as well as our morning plenary on tomorrow morning um, due to the National Day of Mourning. Um, those changes have been updated and are reflected um, in the app. Having said that, I'd like to pause for a brief moment for the Bush family as they grieve the, the loss of former President uh, George H.W. Bush. Thank you. So as I scan the room, I'm really encouraged by the many partners and grassroots organizations in the room, all joined for the common goal of building rural communities. Um, we have over 600 individuals registered for the conference, representing over 47 states. We are extremely pleased to see so many of you from so many different communities and organizations, um, our federal uh, partners, as well as foundation and private funders here to engage in the important conversation around framing, that we're framing as building rural communities. So welcome to you all. I'll come back um, a little bit more and talk about the theme, uh, building rural communities, in a moment. And so what I'd like to quickly do is to provide some general information and reminders about what we've got going on around the conference, um, recognize our partners um, and sponsors before transitioning to our opening plenary. So the first item that I'd like to highlight um, that staff have committed a significant amount of time to making improvements on from our last conference is the conference app. For those of you who participated in uh, 2016, uh, the 2016 Rural Housing Conference, you might recall how great the app was. So this year, um, staff have taken uh, your feedback from the surveys that you submitted as you were exiting the conference, and we've incorporated all of those great changes and suggestions that you've made into the app and made it 100 times better. So show of hands, who in the room has downloaded the conference app? Very good, very good. Um, for those of you who haven't downloaded the app, we encourage you um, to download the app. Um, it is the way that you're able to access all of the information um, that's going on and available through the conference. Um, it's also an awesome networking tool. Um, it's a way for you to connect with like-minded um, practitioners, stakeholders, as well as funders. Um, and so we encourage you to download the app. A second reminder um, is around Twitter. And so as we go through the next few days, um, you'll continue to see and hear uh, Building Rule. Um, we encourage you to use the hashtag Building Rule um, to talk about what you're seeing and hearing around the conference, um, and even continue that discussion as you leave and go back to your respective communities. The third piece of information, and this is one that I'm really excited about, is our uh, quilt raffle. If you've not had an opportunity to stop by the Hack Exhibit booth um, in the exhibit hall, please take a moment to do so. We are selling uh, tickets for the quilt raffle. They are $5 each. Um, all proceeds go to uh, the nonprofit organization that's going to be designated by the Oglala Sioux Tribe. And then the fourth item, um, this is somewhat old, somewhat new, um, but there are sign-up sheets for TTAD, Technical Assistance and Training Division staff, as well as Loan Fund Division staff hours, where you can sign up. Um, we're doing office hours. You might want to come and talk about a loan product, talk about a project that you might have. Um, so please take advantage of that as well. Um, I'm going to quickly wrap by thanking our partners, our sponsors, and as well as our individual donors. Um, as many of you know, um, pulling off an event this size, um, the size of scale without uh, the support and uh, doesn't happen without the support um, of a broad network of sponsors, peers, um, folks that um, contribute to the program. I'd first want to start off by thanking the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, 
um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Home Depot Foundation, the Wells Fargo Housing Foundation, and NeighborWorks America. Those are our partners. Um, I'd also like to extend a very um, hearty thank you to our many sponsors. This year, we had over 36 sponsors that contributed to the conference, so thank you, sir. And I'd also like to thank um, a host of individual sponsors as well. Um, their generous support um, and invaluable contributions helped us to get you here in the room today. Um, so please join me in thanking each of them for bringing us together um, to shape the important conversation around building our communities. So I promised you I would go quickly. Um, so before I do, I would like to move on and introduce our um, special guest moderator and speaker, uh, Joe Belden. Joe was HAC's deputy executive director from 1989 to 2015. He also worked for USDA and several policy-oriented research organizations here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Joe co-edited a book on rural housing and authored other, other reports and articles on housing and community development issues. He is a graduate of the Baylor Law School and the University of Texas, Austin. I'd like to take a quick moment to briefly go off bio uh, for Joe. Um, and to say that of all the many things and the uh, many accomplishments and successes Joe has had, there is one thing that he has been unsuccessful at, and I'm going to share it with you this morning. <laughs> So Joe has tried unsuccessfully at least three times by my count to retire. He's not been able to do that. So um, having said that, um, Joe's uh, demonstration um, through his commitment of almost uh, 30 years of service to Hack and rural America, it runs parallel with Hack's longstanding vision and the 2018 uh, conference theme of building community. So please join me in welcoming Joe Belden. Well, I hope this is on. I guess it's not. Can people hear me now? It's not on. Great. OK. If they don't want to leave me in control of it, I would probably break it. Um, well, thank you, Terry, and thanks to HEC board members and all of you for this invitation to come back. Um, I actually don't like the word retirement. Uh, some of you know Michael Badakin, and he calls himself repurposed, and I sort of <laughs> like that. So, Although I've been trying to get AARP to change their name to the American Association of Repurposed Persons, and it's not worked. But um, it um, definitely is better than recycled, I think. But. Let me just also say about President Bush, um, he was a man who had great socks. I really liked his socks. You can see mine here. But also, on a more serious note, if, if you haven't read the um, appreciation that Maureen Dowd of the New York Times published about him about three days ago, <clears throat> I would encourage you to look at that. I'm sure you can Google Maureen Dowd on Bush, and it's, it's really quite a moving uh, article about her, her, her long journalistic political relationship with them sometimes contentious. Um, anyway, Terry, thank you for the invitation to come back and do this. Um, uh, as Terry is saying, I spent over 30 years at Hack and always enjoyed um, meeting and working with a lot of you, going to Capitol Hill, other, other kinds of things. Um, so I was quite excited when, when um, Terry contacted me, called me to talk about this. Um, she tracked me down to the nursing home. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> And we were able to discuss it a lot after I'd put in my hearing aids. I had to put those hearing aids in. But um, uh, it's fun for me. I hope this is going to be a fun and informative uh, uh, kind of look back and look ahead for, for uh, all of you here. So let me welcome, let's, or please join me in welcoming Hack's outstanding leader to the stage to join me up here. Where are they? Where are they? Wow. I... Thank you. 
Hi, Joe. How are you? So, okay. So, so there are two of them, huh? huh? Well, wow. I, yeah. I think I think maybe. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I think uh, I, I gathered that you didn't realize there was a trans transition at Hack. Uh, I, I, well, we, uh, I heard. I'd, I'd heard we, a few things. We, we, made sure aids we made a change. We made a change. I think the problem may be that he hasn't been reading the hack news. <laughs> so I so, kind of need to catch up on things there, Joe. I don't know what you read over at the nursing home, but uh, I, yeah, we, we did have a little change here. Yeah. So anyway, the good to see you, Joe. A a ARP <laughs> bulletin is what I refer to. <laughs> I did notice there were two chairs up here, so yeah. yeah. All right. OK. All right. Um, well, threw you off script. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as you all know, uh, Hack was founded uh, 48 years ago. I think it'll be 48 years in May. Um, and the two people that have joined me here uh, collectively represent 29 years at Hack um, leadership. Hack leadership. One with 28 years. I'll let you guess which one that is. And one with one year at the helm. That's David. Um, so, um, let me start with David. David, how do you like your new job? How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic, Joe. Uh, this is such an extraordinary opportunity for me. Um, I'm thrilled. It feels like a great fit. I know so many friends uh, and maybe even a little family uh, in the crowd today, and so I'm thrilled to be here. But first, really, let's take a moment. Uh, I, I hope all of you will join me. Uh, in recognizing that this institution, this structure that we have in the Housing Assistance Council as it's represented so much of rural America uh, in, in DC uh, is here because of the immense contribution of these two fellows. And one of those contributions, I have to say, is the help and support that they've given me in coming in. Uh, these are big shoes. I thought about trying on like some big clown <laughs> shoe as I walked up to stage. Uh, but the reality is, it's the organization, and Moises has helped me deeply understand that, that this organization lives and breathes and thrives through the work of all of us. So it's fun and wonderful, and thanks for the question, Joe, to be here uh, doing it, but it's really this crowd and this group of folks, and the transition we're making ain't easy, uh, but it's been great to have the support of these guys, so really appreciate you guys helping me out. Uh, with that, I would also like to take a chance at the beginning here to recognize our board. Um, can you raise your hands, please? The people with their hands up in the crowd. Yeah, give them a round of applause. I can't imagine a group of people who made a better decision one year ago. <laughs> Hey, you guys have been great. Thank you for your help and support. I know we're going through a lot and we're transitioning, but man, look how strong yesterday was and how strong today is. So this has been fantastic. So thank you as well. And to get to an event like today, you can't do it without an amazing and hardworking staff. We've been at this for months, and I think it really shows. It looks so smooth here. Somebody asked me yesterday when I had no idea where the Massachusetts room was, uh, well, aren't you in charge? I was like, no, I'm attending. Thank you. Uh, we've got staff that are in charge and are doing a fantastic job. So if you guys could raise your hands as well, I'd really appreciate it. Let's recognize you. Thanks. Uh, great. Did I say anything about the job? No, no, you didn't go too far off script. That was great. Something that that most of you may not know is that something that the three of us share is that we were all uh, fired from USDA by incoming Republican presidents. So, yeah. We says and I about 100 years ago. But, um, which leads me to ask you, Moises. Moises, I know, worked at Hack forever. He was, he, and he was one of the retreads who sort of came back um, after we were fired by Ronald Reagan. Um, uh, we actually didn't know each other at USDA. But you were present uh, pretty much at, almost at the beginning of HEC, um, Boyce says. And uh, what, do you, what do you think was some of the original thinking behind the establishment of the Housing Assistance Council? And do you think that's uh, still valid today? Well, um, 
Yeah, the Housing Assistance Council is a product of the war on poverty, um, a concept that was really started in the uh, Jack Kennedy administration and implemented during the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration. And, and to kind of talk about the whole thinking behind the creation of HACC, uh, why a HACC? Uh, I, if I could, I'd like to put into context uh, some of what was happening at the time, a little history, if you will. Uh, back in the 60s, 70s, uh, the country was going through a great change. Uh, some of the names you may recognize that were big icons of the area, uh, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, Cesar Chavez, Russell Means. It, it was a time of, of, of giants. It was a time of people who were making a difference, making a lot of noise. <clears throat> it was also the time of the Vietnam War, uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, there were student protests. And there was, yes, there was a federal effort to fight poverty. Uh, at the time, there were many challenges, uh, as there are now. But I also remember at the time, there was a sense that we could do something. There was sort of the feeling that we could make a difference, that we could change the world. It was uh, kind of an idealism uh, that I think uh, permeated throughout the society and the people that had the concerns that all of you have. Uh, a, a, an important figure in all of this, in all of this was uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, there's, there's three quick stories that I think affected his outlook. One was when he was young, he was a teacher in a Mexican-American school in South Texas. And he learned and saw and was touched and moved by the conditions those students lived in the limited resources they had, the struggles they had to go through. Um, also, many of you probably know that Lyndon Baines Johnson did a tour of Appalachia, uh, got a real first-hand view of some of the poverty uh, with, with those parts of the country. And, and then there's another story that's not as well known. <clears throat> when Lyndon Baines Johnson moved to Washington, he asked his staff from Texas, some of the people that worked for him, uh, to come up with him, uh, as, as many leaders do, they bring staff they know to, to work with them. And there was an a African-American couple who drove up, and Johnson was very, very upset when he learned that on their trip up, they faced all kinds of humiliation. They couldn't use bathrooms because they were whites-only bathrooms and things like that. And he was very, very upset. And all these things affected his long-term thinking. Uh, there, there were many, many, uh, I think, uh, accomplishments uh, that even affect us today. Uh, the creation of Medicare, creation of Medicaid, uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. Uh, Self-help housing was first funded through the Office of Economic Opportunity. Uh, so there were many things that, that uh, were happening at the time when, when the idea of hack uh, was floating around. Uh, the war on poverty was about pulling people out of poverty, obviously, giving them dignity, uh, giving them the opportunity. Uh, it was about creating institutions of change. Uh, for example, the community action agencies that now are all over the country, making a big difference in many communities, uh, were all part of that, of that era. Uh, I remember another thing about Lyndon Baines Johnson. He would make these speeches, and he would talk about how we have to provide a job for every household. We have to provide a classroom for every child, and we have to provide a house for every family. So it was within that time and that era that the thinking of a Housing Assistance Council, an institution that dealt with one of those three uh, important issues, housing, uh, needed to be created, uh, needed to be made a reality. Now, the interesting thing is that when HAC was founded, the founders were not housers. Uh, they were largely civil rights groups, 
community activists, labor leaders, poverty warriors. They were people that didn't necessarily understand the mechanics, the technical parts of housing, but they were people who understood that housing was such an important part of lifting people up that they knew the creation of a housing assistance council uh, was necessary. As a matter of fact, um, one of the people who developed the concept and developed the proposal to create a housing assistance council is in the audience. It was an activist, lawyer, real estate developer, a woman by the name of Laureate West. Laureate, you're in the audience. Say, get up. One of the things that the War on Poverty did was it supported local efforts. It was important that change take place at the local level. And so the Housing Assistance Councils, the whole idea behind the Housing Assistance Council was let's create a national organization. At the time, intermediary was not in the lexicon. Uh, I, I don't think we ever heard that word at the time. But in effect, to create an intermediary that supported those local efforts, that, that provided the backup, the assistance, the technical assistance, and any other kind of support that local efforts needed to make that change that was the whole point of the war on poverty. So that's kind of the context, the atmosphere, the time, and the purpose, the reason for a creation of the Housing Assistance Council. Now, the second part of your question, Joe, was, um, is it still valid today? And I'd say, claro que sí. Absolutamente. Yes, yes, yes. You know, the challenges may seem different, and we do have battles that maybe aren't quite the same, but a lot of the challenges are the same. Racism continues to rear its ugly head. Income inequality. We have a growing opioid or drug crisis in our country and in rural America. And our population is aging. All those things require local efforts, strong action, and a Housing Assistance Council needs to be ready to back up those local actions. So, do we need a Housing Assistance Council today? Yes. Thank you, Joe. I hope that helps. Thank you, Moises. That's, that's very impressive. Um, very. <clears throat> and I appreciate those uh, remarks about LBJ. 50 years ago, he was not our hero, um, particularly me since he drafted me into the Army. But, but uh, perspectives change. If you haven't read Robert Caro's multi-volume biography of him, I would highly recommend it. It's a wonderful book. There's several books. David, turning to you, um, you've worked at the local level in housing. You've worked at HUD and at USDA. Given that experience and that perspective, where do you think we are today regarding housing policy and programs? Picking up on uh, Moises's historic structure they put forward, I mean, let's, let's think about what we have. We have a drug epidemic, an area that's depopulating rapidly, civic structures that are in default, struggling reputation, and I'm talking about 1974 New York City. I'm talking about the time in which Hack was founded, where the eyes of the nation were on a geography and the challenges that existed there that is not the reason that Hack exists and works, but it's fundamentally tied to what we do. Look, we know how to change things. We know how to change narratives. We know how to organize governments and people around bringing prosperity and vitality to places that lack it, to bring populations back to their homes, to bring the wealth and civic structures around them. We can do that. And, and so if you thought I was describing today's rural America when I said that, 
Well, yeah, there are some of those problems. Deep strengths mm -hmm. in the towns that I'm from. I grew up in central Ohio and part of the time in, you know, in the Kanawha Valley, West Virginia. And, and those places have gone some very different directions. Today's rural is different than it was in 1974. But so many of the problems persist. And guess what? We have lived through an era where we have created a federal structure that knows how to address poverty. Have we solved it? No. This little secret that uh, I don't think I admitted when I was interviewing with the board is yes, I had worked in New York City for a while, and <laughs> Oakland, California, and on and on. And I'm just like so many kids who, in my, repu in my um, era of rural, left those small towns, ran off to the bright lights in big city, tried to make it happen there, tried to recognize it, and it is growing into adulthood that I've recognized the strength that I got from those small towns, the value and the place that is there, and the immense strength that remains, that we know how to build. I, I, you know, when I was in New York City, I learned a lot of lessons about how you structure organizations, how you bring capital and wealth to communities that don't have it. We know how to do those answers. What we need to do is capture the attention of folks who've been doing that for a generation or more, of putting together amazing structures. CRA may be one of the biggest forces of aggregating affordable capital away from rural places in our modern era, and yet I've worked, and you guys have worked for a lifetime, caring and thinking and structuring things like CRA to be able to function. We know how to do those things. Let's apply them to the geography we're working. And quite frankly, that puts me in a place where I'm sick and tired of being in a preservation crouch. I, I'm tired of trying to protect what we've got. We need to grow. We need to point out that persistent poverty is not okay in the pockets and places that hack works. And so when I look at today's housing policy and programs, <coughs> to your question, Joe, we got, we got a long way to go. There is a growing understanding of the places in which we are from that we care deeply about and that we work hard on. We need to use this moment in time to draw people's attention to it and make some real progress to policy and programs that can take from the lessons that you guys taught us and grow us into a place where vitality grows in small towns. Great. You know, thank you, David. Um, Moises, turning back to you, I recall from Hack's history uh, two particular stories that I always liked um, about things Hack had, had done in the past and I think sort of represent uh, why um, all of us in this room sort of do this sort of work. And maybe you can reflect on those, or remind us of those stories. One was about the rain, and the other one was about the simple notion of listening to what people in communities really need. So maybe you can enlighten us. Sure, Joe. Um, I, I do have to preface uh, the two stories that you're referring to uh, by telling you that one of my fondest memories growing up uh, was listening to my dad tell stories. Um, it was always fascinating to hear about growing up, about getting beat up by the Border Patrol, about crossing the river, and all those other fun things. Um, but there, was, there, was, there were times when um, I'd say, Dad, you've told me that story before. <laughs> A hundred times, Dad. I find myself now in that situation, and, and uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you these stories, but if you've been around and have heard me speak, you've heard the stories, so please don't say, Moises, you've told us those stories before. Uh, Too but bad, they have to hear them again. <laughs> yeah. but they're, they're, they're important, uh, I think, to get back to my point about, we have to listen, we have to pay attention to the local efforts. It's not about us, it's about what's being done on the ground. And the story you're referring to, about, uh, Joe, about the rain is uh, in Louisiana, the Housing Assistance Council worked with a community. It was a mill, uh, a mill town where lumber, the lumber industry uh, was uh, on decline. Uh, there was a company town where the lumber was being milled and prepared. Uh, and because of the declining economy and lumber industry in the area, this company town that existed for the workers of the area uh, was being closed down. The housing wasn't much 
uh, to think of, but nonetheless, it's where people lived through generations. When the town, uh, when the company uh, threatened to close down the town, uh, I'm not sure how it happened, but somebody got in touch with the Housing Assistance Council. And we were able to go in and with the direction of the local community, uh, we were able to buy up the little town, rebuild the little town with both rental and ownership housing. There was a woman who, who was all four feet 10 Mariah Milton, who was definitely the leader of that community. I remember we used to meet in the old uh, church, uh, kind of uh, the place where the community would gather. <clears throat> and after the reconstruction and the rebuilding and everything looked really great, uh, Mariah Milton was being interviewed uh, by uh, one of the local reporters on the success. <clears throat> And so they asked her, now that you own a home, and in fact, she became a 502 homeowner, uh, you know, what's different? You know, what, what have you got to say to us? And she thought for a second, and she said, uh, you know what? You know what the difference is? She said, last night, it rained, and I didn't notice. The other story you're talking about Joe, again, is about what does the community need, not what do we think the community needs. Uh, this, this was in Georgia, southern Georgia. Uh, there was this small community. It was only about 1,000 people. Talk about small towns. The community was 90% African American, 10% white. But as you can imagine, forever, as far back as you could think, it, the mayor, the city council, it was all white. Um, there was a highway that divided the communities. On one side, you had the white community, which was, you know, there were airline pilots and, you know, well-to-do people. And on the other side of the highway was the black community with uh, lean-to shacks, you know, old wooden housing. So at an election, they elected, the community elected the first black mayor and one city councilman who was also black. The mayor was the funeral director in the community. Again, I'm not sure how it happened, but they got in touch with Hack. And he invited us to come in and speak to the community. They held the town meeting and we made our pitch, you know, housing and 502 and all CDBG and all this kind of stuff. And the community people who packed the room listened very intently and very politely. But when it was time for questions, one elderly gentleman in the back said, you know, we appreciate your talk about housing and we know we need housing. You know, it's very obvious. He said, but what we really need is a fire truck. You see, what we weren't aware of was that just a few weeks before, there had been a fire. And because the old wooden houses were so close together, the whole block had burned off. People had tried with their buckets and any way they could to put the fire out, but they weren't successful. We were confronted in a community that said, we appreciate all your housing knowledge and expertise and you know, all this talk about section whatever and then ever. But if you really want to help us, you know, help us get a fire truck. Well, I'm happy to say our Southeast office in Atlanta went to work, helped the community build, uh, apply for CDBG funding, and we were able to get them a fire truck from San Francisco. They were getting new trucks. They had trucks they could uh, get rid of, so we were able to do that. Then we were able to go back and talk about 504s, rehabbing the housing, things of that sort. I think the point of the conversations, as I think is the point of this conference, as I think is the point of the Housing Assistance Council, is let's support the community needs, what the community identifies, not what we think they need. You know, when we sat down, uh to start talking about transition. Moises told me that story, powerful, uh, truly. And, and also told me to get outside the Beltway and go visit some places right away. 
And so obviously I said, yes, sir, and, and got a couple of plane tickets. And when, one of the first places I, I went was one of the poorest counties of Alabama. Had a little bit of time in Alabama, uh, uh, married into a family that has some Alabama roots, and showed up in New Bern, uh, which is this tiny little town in Hale County. Anybody been to New Bern? <laughs> yeah, uh, even six or seven hands. Um, well, there should be at least one table full of folks here uh, who, who are from New Bern, who work in New Bern, and, and showed me that exact same lesson. You're going to see it on stage. Uh, I, our schedule's jumping around a little, but I think it's uh, still tomorrow, uh, where Auburn University is in town uh, trying to help out. One of the very first things they did, the first building built in this couple hundred person town in New Bern, Alabama in 110 years was a fire hall. And it was that first trip, and I'm thinking Moises' story in my head, and I saw that, and I said, here's the story. We need to lift up because it's so exemplary of what we're trying to do in today's day. Great. Let me, let me ask both of you to reflect on this. And it, you know, it, it seems that both Republican and Democratic administrations keep wanting to eliminate or cut the rural housing programs. Uh, to our great frustration. So why do you think this keeps <laughs> reoccurring and what do you think we can do? Tough question. Sorry. What? I just get to ask the question. <laughs> they have to answer the yeah. question. Well, you know, getting, getting attention for rural America has always been a challenge. Uh, ever since I can remember uh, trying to tell the story before policymakers in Congress. And, and, and it's true, both Democrats and Republicans, the administrations have been challenging. Uh, I think our saving grace many of those times has been the Congress. Uh, and I think that's, that's a tribute to all of you. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, we used to say jokingly, uh, you know, HUD knows housing but doesn't know rural. The Department of Ag knows rural but doesn't know housing. And, and both HUD and, and uh, the Department of Agriculture have rural housing programs. But the support they get fluctuates so much. It depends on who's in power, what kind of attention they're paying to the programs. Uh, it depends on what their proposals, their budget proposals uh, state. And a lot of times it's, again, a tribute to all of you that we're able to go to a Congress that because it's response more directly to you, uh, I think because uh, it, it understands and you understand what political power is like, uh, more often than not, we're getting a better response from the Congress itself. The fact that we continue to have rural housing programs, I think, is, is a real uh, show of what you yourselves can do through the Rural Housing Coalition, through HACC, through other organizations that push and continue to keep those issues in front, in, in, in front of the Congress. Now, that's not to say administrations haven't been supported. We have had administrations that listen, uh, have us over at meetings, uh, you know, sometimes uh, introduce initiatives that are, that are very helpful to us. Uh, but I think, I, I don't know that that's gonna change much. One of the things we do know is that this last election has brought focus on rural America, in some ways, in the wrong way. But, but the fact that we have continuously been ignored, we as a community of rural America, uh, I think is reflected in the fact that there was a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of feeling of being ignored, being unappreciated. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the voters that's not the only reason, there are other reasons. But a lot of voters came out and made that statement. I think that all of you have a great story to tell. And I think have done a good job in telling that story, and fighting back and pushing back. Uh, but I think uh, we have to continue and you know, we always say we have to do better, we have to do better. The fact is that we not only have to continue to push back with the work we do and the accomplishments and the successes we have, uh, but it's probably true, we have to keep pushing back harder, saying these things work, these people, these things pull people out of poverty, these things can be successful, 
they add to the tax base, they add to the wealth of the country. There are so many reasons why it makes sense to support rural housing programs. But other people are telling their stories. We need to tell our story. Uh, and so it gets back to that local effort, that local power, and uh, again, a tribute to all of you. Yeah, I think uh, this era of smaller government persists, right? Since, since the early uh, 80s or before, the uh, amount of attention and respect for federal government ha has been uh, contracting. Um, you know, I, would, I had several appointments from the last president to work in that administration and, and absolutely accept and, and reflect what Moises is saying. It was hard to get airtime for rural. And it, I mean, it's a president that I respect deeply and thrilled to be uh, connected to that, but um, even getting that attention uh, within that administration was not easy. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you guys feel that. Um, and it, uh, we have a, a new program that's gonna be coming at, at HAC, maybe I'll say a bit more, uh, as we go on to try to reflect that. But, but think about it as we do. We're, how many places can we have this conversation, right? Like, how many places do we sit down publicly as a community of practice and a group of folks who care about this geography and really try to think through what is it that's special and unique about the places that we are working on. Not a lot of places here to speak tr that truth to power, and Hack has been one of them, to your guys' amazing credit over the years, that people have gathered here and done that. We've obviously always done a lot more than housing, uh, and we need to continue to be able to speak that, that truth to power. Great, thank you, Mr. David, or to both of you. Um, both of you were born into rural communities, and how would you say that that has informed your work? Yeah, uh, so I, my growing up in central Ohio, uh, and then some time spent in Montgomery, West Virginia, I think is, is exemplary. Uh, I'm trying to use big words on stage, sorry. Um, <laughs> In, in what's happened in a lot of rural places. Yeah, as I said, I, I feel like I'm so much like my peers. I think of it as a rural diaspora. So many of us grew up in these small towns and ran off to big cities and are recognizing now in this era of the, of the nurturing and strength of those towns and places that we wanna continue to stay connected to. Um, but, but the two places I grew up, uh, anybody been to Westerville, Ohio? Oh, all right couple of hands there. Um, that's no rural town anymore, right? When I moved in there, it was all the family farms that were closing across uh, the Midwest, and those populations were coming into town, and we were growing exponentially. Our high schools were trailers put together because they couldn't handle the population coming in. We were losing that rurality so rapidly, and the growth and the strength and the prosperity in there is amazing. You go back now, and you know, Westerville's a postcard of the perfect main street of rural America, surrounded by these big old houses all around uh, that main street. And it's amazing. And that, that is a rural story of our era. Another rural story is Montgomery, West Virginia, where I spent some many years. Uh, and I see Dave and some friends from West Virginia. Anybody been to Montgomery? Uh, oh, jail, of course, yeah. Um, we went to Montgomery, a town of several thousand folks, tucked into the hillside of the Kanawha Valley, Kanawha River, to go to West Virginia Tech, uh, where my dad worked for the school. And, and I was on, this is a story, I guess, of modernity. I was on Google Maps the other day, and I'm coasting up and down, looking at the street view, which is a totally fascinating thing. I'm sure you all have done it. And I'm looking for the place where I grew up. That apartment building, we had a tiny little faculty apartment building up and down the street, and it's, it's gone. And, and the story, as these guys can tell you, the, the university is gone. They have pulled up the roots, West Virginia Tech, and it no longer exists in this town whose anchor institution is not dying, it's gone. And, and that story also informs me as I look at the dichotomy of these two very real rural narratives of today like, what is it that drives the prosperity of one place and not another? And it, and it helps me inform to know that 
it's not just mud on the boots that is rural. We are, as our amazing research director, Lance George, often talks, we are a collection of rural places. We are ruralities. And, and that's true for so many of us. Our stories are different, yet they all do exist in a rural context. And that's been true for me as well. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that those of us who have had experience uh, in no rural areas sometimes are frustrated by the fact that some of the people who don't have that connection or that experience don't get it. Uh, the old timers will remember with me one of the icons of rural housing, Clay Cochran, oh, used yeah. to talk about Metropolitana. And what he would refer to is the fact that there was this thinking in urban areas that, well, people in rural areas will grow up and they'll all eventually move to the city so we don't have to worry about rural areas. And, and it continues to be, I think, a myth that many people hold, uh, which makes it difficult for us to sort of talk about rural and how it's different and how it's unique and how it requires attention, not just as an afterthought of urban, but really with its own set of issues and, 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 uh, and problems. Uh, so, so absolutely, I mean, having that connection is very, very important. However, I do want to say that you don't have to be from a rural area to support rural America. In fact, I suspect some of you grew up in urban areas but have seen the need in rural America and decided that you want to work in those areas. In fact, you will remember, Joe, <coughs> when we used to go to the Congress, many of the supporters of rural America, rural housing programs, rural development were from urban areas. So, so that I think the connection, the background, the experience in rural America obviously gives you a better perspective, a better connection, a better understanding. Uh, but at the same time, I, I want to make clear, it, it doesn't mean that if you're not from a, a rural area, you don't have something to contribute. And, and I think, in fact, that's, that's been proven time and again. David, let me ask this of you. Um, do you see HAC as a housing organization? Well, obviously, or is it somewhat more than that? And are, what are the concerns or issues about possibly going more broadly into community development? Um, great question. Uh, one the board has often asked me in this first year, um, and, and hopefully they, uh, they heard answers that excite them. It, it, HAC is a place where rural folk have gathered and had this conversation. We have always done that. You guys have supported it in the loans we've kind of done, in the uh, research and advocacy. It's, we already are so much more than housing. Um, I do think about a hack moving forward that more directly embraces that, that, that thinks some more about how you know, health and education and welfare of the local population is extraordinarily important. Uh, to be recognized within the context of housing. And guess what? That, that's where modern science has taken us. Social science today has shown us that there are determinants of your health outcomes that are absolutely tied to the specific place you grew up. There's no stronger predictor of your adult wealth than your zip code. And there is huge predictors in what your health outcomes in life will be by your zip code. Well, our zip codes in rural places do predict those things as well. And on average right now, it is not a great story. Uh, and so concentrating on that broader thing, two things uh, quickly that we've, we are taking on as we move forward. I've alluded to a few times. I am honored and thrilled that uh, Moises started the ball rolling and our staff have kept it rolling in understanding what placemaking looks like, to understand that place-based policy is extraordinarily important that housing programs are what we do and we need to put those in context. And I'm thrilled, proud to, to announce today that the National uh, Endowment for the Arts has invested a long-term contract of several hundred thousand dollars in the Housing Assistance Council to get to the ground, to do local planning, 
that is based on land use plans, using our historic and cultural resources and economic development to deliver technical assistance on the ground. And I, I would be thrilled if you would join me in a round of applause that these guys had the forethought to do that. The Citizens Institute on Rural Design, it's called today. It's been around for a while, run by a very nice New York City organization. We've convinced NEA to invest in us. Um, the other is the Ford Foundation's back, and they are playing with us again. Um, they have generously granted us uh, a, a contract to take a strong look at something that we labeled the Rural Prosperity Project. But look, if there's another foundation out there that wants it to be called the Something Endowment of Futures, just come on. We'll take your donation and we'll call it the MacArthur Fund for Rural Communities. Uh, soon, maybe after, after we talk. Uh, look, as you heard me say before, there's not a place where we as a community of practice come together in DC easily and readily that's named Rural Institute, just like the Urban Institute or something like that to recognize what policy formation does to outcomes. So one of my favorite things to say is always that we are causing tomorrow's problems today, right? Like, let's be humble enough to recognize it no matter how brilliant the things we're working on today. 20 years from now, when someone's sitting here and, and I'm handing over the baton as Moises is doing, um, we're gonna be like, oh my God, what were they thinking in 2018 to to have founded that. And one of the issues is that we don't run public policy through a rural lens always. You've, some of you have heard me talk about opportunity zones and opportunity funds. I won't get into it here. But to put together what could be one of the most powerful community development structures that we're doing in the modern era and to not even thought about the way that that plays out in a rural market starved for capital is not OK. We need a place here that understands how to do that. And so as, as I said, Ford Foundation has generously come in and asked us to take a good long look at it. We have formed a partnership with uh, the Urban Institute. Pardon the irony there, I know. But um, if you're trying to solve the lack of something, you have to go to where it is. Uh, and the Aspen Institute have both contracted and signed up to work with us uh, together to do a, uh, to look at how we can create a community of practice here in town. I don't think that it's gonna be bricks and mortar. We're not gonna have a rural institute over sitting next to the urban institute, but how to create a community of practice here, backed with real research done at the level of rigor that can affect public policy and put into a way that's communicated with and to our community that we continue to gather here and grow our strength. We got to do it. We got to organize and we got to at least recognize that it needs to be done here with the reality and the authenticity of rural folks leading that. Uh, so I'm hopeful for this next year. A lot of you will be getting phone calls for qualitative interviews and things like that on how we can form it. Uh, but who knows, maybe a couple years, two, four years from now, at one of these conferences, we will recognize that there is new institutions forming here that can carry our narrative much stronger. Uh, in the federal policy space. Great. And, and let me just say, when you're doing that transition in 20 years, Moises and I can come back and, and Laureate, and we can help with it again. So. All right, come, one, one more really easy softball question for, for both of you. Uh, culturally, economically, politically, the country is seems to be more and more polarized between urban and rural. So why do you think this is happening? What do you think this has happened in, what do you think about or what could be done to try to uh, uh, solve some of that gap that seems to be growing? Easy question. Yeah. Real solid. That's why I invited Moises yeah. up in yeah, case there right. were hard right. questions. <laughs> well, uh, I think a lot of the polarization started some time ago and it's been building and and the I think the surprise if I can call it that the surprise election has made that worse so the hope there is that when the results of that election are changed or undone or whatever happens I think a lot of that polarization may ease up but the fact is it's been building up for some time 
I think there are, uh, I, I think you play an important role because you are from a rural America that doesn't necessarily represent what we're afraid of as, as, as creating a lot of this polarization. I think you can be a counterweight uh, to a lot of that uncivil, very really ugly and difficult uh, dialogue that's going on. The work you do, uh, the people you work with, the community that you work with and that supports you, I think can counterbalance all of that. There are things that in the horizon that, that give me some hope. Uh, the recent election, I think, showed a repudiation of what I think is a lot of that polarization. And I, I think and I hope that is sort of, that begins to foretell maybe an easing of that uncivility. Uh, I think that uh, we have seen students uh, rise up against gun violence recently and they've begun to organize. And uh, I think just like I mentioned when I was getting into this arena, there was that sense of we can change the world, we can do something. Uh, I think a lot of the student movement uh, can grow beyond just the guns <coughs> and, and can give this fresh energy and this fresh hope and idealism to begin to make those changes. I also think the Me Too movement has begun to make an impact and I think we'll begin to make some of the changes that are gonna get us to a place where the polarization may not be as bad. We've always had, in politics, we've always had some degree of polarization. Uh, and I think that that will continue. The difference is really the way we dehumanize, uh, the way we disrespect, uh, the way we uh, condemn uh, or demonize uh, is what, uh, what we need to change. And, and I think, uh, again, I think you play a big role in doing that, given that you are located in rural communities and you can counterbalance a lot of that very negative, sort of very disturbing trend that has taken us. And maybe as I get older, I gain back the optimism, but I think some of those changes begin to maybe foretell that maybe we're turning the corner. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Okay. Um, again, this is for both of you, but for a, a federally funded, you know, national intermediary in CDFI, um, uh, heck has uh, uh, remained focused on a particular, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm trying Getting to remember sleepy. not to applaud the bang on this, I'll break the gears, but uh, I'm gonna bang on myself. Lots of applause lines here, or points, boys. I'm sorry, for a, for a federally funded national intermediary, housing intermediary and community development intermediary and a CDFI, HAC has always stuck to its, its niche, its traffic <coughs> niche of, of rural. Um, do you think, uh, for both of you, do you think this has been the right approach in helping rural communities? Uh, you want me to take a crack at it? Yeah. Uh, I think it's been an important niche in helping rural communities. Uh, I think that, you know, I'm gonna keep going back to this because I, I really think this is key. I really think that we need to gauge what the community needs. Um, the, 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 the process of deciding whether HACK changes direction or whether HACK, in fact, expands beyond what it's been doing really has to do with the needs in the community. Now, we all know that when you go to a community, they don't have one problem. They don't have a housing problem. You go in and solve the housing problem and everything's fine. We know that. We've always recognized that. We know that there's education problems. We know there's opioid crisis. We know there's education problems, economic development, finding jobs. There's all sorts of things that happen. I think the decision by Hack has been that we can't do everything. We can't try to do everything. So what you try to do is you say, I can help you with this. And given the finite resources we have, uh, I can become an expert in this. But I, you know, other things, I, I can't. It, it, it would be foolish, I think. 
uh, the importance of partnerships and relationships becomes key because what you want to do is bring in the National Rural Health Association. You want to bring in the Rural uh, Water and Sewer Associations. You want to bring in the other organizations that bring the expertise to communities that we can't bring. But it's all based on an understanding with the community that we can help you with this. Our resources will only take us this far. Uh, if, in fact, the board of directors, the policymakers of this organization say, we really have to start looking at areas where we haven't been before, a process of communicating, learning, consulting with local communities and the network of organizations like yours, I think will inform it about which direction to take. But there have to be considerations of capacity. There have to be cons considerations of budget. There have to be considerations of how much can you do. You can't do everything for everyone. So how far do you want to go? But I think that the, the articles of incorporation of the Housing Assistance Council are broad enough that it gives the organization leeway to go in different directions. It gives it the flexibility. And whether it does or not is, is a judgment call, but the judgment call has to be based on how can we best serve the communities and the organizations that work on the ground with those communities. And we, uh, so in, in some of the transition conversations, we talked the most about getting local organizations strong and a new network and a next generation of those growing that can deliver a lot of that. I have local government uh, experience and, and think about how we were able to accomplish things on the ground that are locally driven. And so when Moises and I talked about that, um, we recognized that the investment the federal government's making in that core task that we do of capacity building on the ground has waned. And, and where's the next generation of these groups coming, right? Like there are some phenomenal folks in the room here today that hack with these guys and other institutions have helped to grow and strengthen. Is there another generation of that coming behind us? I hope so, but we've got a lot of hard work to do if we're gonna keep doing that. So to be able to deliver all of what we're talking about, there is a core and fundamental thing that Moises talked about as we transitioned, and I've taken straight to heart, that we have to keep busy at HACS core function of building local groups, uh, or we're not gonna get there. There's not gonna be a room full of folks capable to be here and advocate in the future. So absolutely, Joe, there is, there is a fundamental need for doing that kind of organizing in local places by a rural focused group. Mm -hmm. There's got to be somebody in the room to ask the question why. Right. Okay, um, we're winding down here, folks. To Moises, let me ask, what one or two pieces of candid advice might you offer to David as we're moving forward in, in rural My housing? <laughs> Maybe not too candid, but... Right, but, yeah, uh, but, take it easy. No, seriously. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to do two things, Joe. Uh, one is I'm going to be preachy. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to give one or two. I'm going to give more than that. <laughs> okay, we, have, we have time. We have time. That's good. Uh, yeah. Stretch it out. The thing is that um, you know it's 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 uh, it, it would take a long time, and 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 David and I have spent some time together about how I perceive things and how I see things. Uh, it's not my show, it's uh, now David's show and the board of directors who have to decide uh, what direction to take and where the organization goes. I, I believe in making a clean break and you know, I, I, I had my chance and whatever I did or didn't do, uh, it's done. You know, need to, you know, it's about new leadership, it's about new blood, new ideas and moving on. But there are some basic things that I think are very important. Uh, first of all, I think we have to be true to the mission. Once the board of directors, once the community groups, once uh, the staff all understand that 
here's what we've decided that our mission is, is always remember to go back and be true to it. And the mission that the organization has followed since the outset is one to work with the most vulnerable. The, the organization in, in its mission statement talks about working with the most rural and the poorest in the most rural. Which is why I think we've made attempts from the beginning to work with migrant workers, to work with Native Americans, people in Appalachia, people who probably don't have many other places to look to for support. And, and I think, in my mind, that's what's given Hack the reputation it has. That's what's given Hack the, the credibility it has. And that's an area where I think Hack can make real contributions. And that's what attracted me to Hack in the first place. Uh, the easy ones, you know, you take and you work there. The difficult ones, if no one else is going to do it, you know, someone has to do it. And I think that that's the Housing Assistance Council. The, along with that mission, the support of local efforts, which I keep coming back to, is so important. We don't know what's best where we sit. You know what's best. You know, local communities, local organizations like yours that work in local communities know what those needs are. You have ideas. You are probably the best laboratory for change, for making things different on the ground. And the truth is that it's local communities and local organizations that wield the power. When we used to visit Congress or visit administration officials, you know, we went and hack as a reputation, which is helpful. But our real power was purporting, at least we, we always felt we were, but you know, maybe sometimes we weren't sure, but purporting that we speak for you. Voters, local people who make a difference. Uh, we can influence, but I think the power is where, where you are. The other thing that's important is building institutions and leadership. Now, local leaders make things happen, but it's institutions that sustain a movement. Uh, without leaders, a lot of things probably just wouldn't go anywhere. But leaders come and go. And what you want to do is establish an institution that stays. So that if someone who started some activity, uh, something meaningful, for some reason were not around anymore, and it happens, you want that to continue and not go away when that leader goes away. The building of institutions for sustainable, long-term effects, I think, is very, very important. Information sharing and dissemination. When Hack first started, there was a dearth of information, useful information, in rural communities. That's probably tr still true to some extent, but we have technology that has now made a big difference in, in information. But I always say at these conferences, you listen to some great speakers, you'll be inspired and you'll learn. You'll go to workshops where you're going to pick up pointers and technical things to take back to your communities. All that's very valuable. But the one ingredient that I think is as valuable or even more valuable is you come together as a network, you learn from one another, you inspire one another, you learn from one another. That I think is a very valuable role for the Housing Assistance Council uh, to, to, to play. And this, is, uh, this sounds hokey, but I think it's important. I think you listen. You learn so much. You listen. You want to hear. At our level, uh, Dave, what the staff thinks is so important what the board thinks is so important, what local communities think is so important. And the way we grow and benefit and move ahead is by listening to all of them. And finally, something that's very personal with me is that 
We do our work because we believe people need an opportunity. We believe that there are people out there that just given the chance, you know, they can change their lives. And I think that's how we get our own fulfillment. That's why we enter into this field. I know it's not because of the paycheck. Uh, but I always say, let's remember to treat those beneficiaries with respect, give them the dignity they deserve. Please, don't feel sorry for them. Don't pity them. Their lives are admirable. I always think, if I hadn't gotten the breaks I got, if I hadn't run into strokes of good luck, I could easily be there. These are people that I think, given the circumstances they have to endure, really merit our admiration, not our pity. And I think it's always important to remember that. Great. Thank you, Moises. I think that's great. But sort of turning sort of the same question to David. David, if you had to ask Moises for advice on one more thing, there may be at least one more thing, uh, what would that be, possibly? Um, so I've indulged uh, that question many times, and I appreciate uh, a lot of the advice and support I've gotten. So maybe, uh, maybe I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I do just want to give a very heartfelt thank you and appreciation. Uh, this is an extraordinary resource. I'm honored and humbled uh, to be a part of it, and I, and I just can't thank you guys enough uh, for setting us up uh, for a future of success. Um, and I guess I would also be uh, remiss if I didn't steal a minute here at the end of our time uh, to uh, recognize and thank my family. Uh, the the almost, oh, eight, actually it's today, my daughter's birthday, uh, turns eight uh, and six. Uh, are, are, my, are my everything uh, and, and my extraordinary wife uh, who's here today, but I won't look in that direction uh, in case I tear up, uh, whose immense support and carrying a huge load uh, has allowed me to take a running start at this for the year, so that's been fantastic, and that is something uh, that we talked about early, of trying to be able to understand the balance. I care deeply about uh, family being part of Hack's day-to-day -day life stuff, and so, so in tr transition, that'll continue, and I'm, I just, I'm deeply grateful for what you guys have given me already. Thank you, David. And I think certainly we all know families are important. I did manage to download the app, but only with the help of my wife. But <laughs> I would have asked my children, but I get too much scorn from them when I <laughs> ask them for electronic help. Well, David, sort of, sort of final question for our session here. Where do you see the rural housing movement or industry in five years or 20 years? And I promise not to come back and say retired, but. Well, I mean, even in the, like, predicting the next five minutes in this town is a wackadoodle exercise, man. It's just, like, everything is turned upside down today. So, so if you think we can predict, I'm not sure. Uh, we talked about the mainstream streaming of the rural narrative right now and our opportunity to take advantage of that. That's true. You talk about 20 years from now, I mean, there's going to be intense pressure on our ecosystems that we're going to have to change the way we live and build and exist as collective societies. We're going to be majority-minority nation by 2045, according to the census, you know, give or take a few years there. There's some real social reckoning to, to adjust and understand, and we have the opportunity to carry that narrative of the importance of shared power uh, across race and gender and orientation and all of those things. Um, I mean, you've got disruptive technologies cranking, like you know, CRISPR and, and biofacturing that we may not even, you know, stick-built housing may be this existing relic of the past at that point, just like the dial-up phone in my hotel room right now really is, 
is an existing relic that's nearly gone. Stick-built housing may feel the same way in 20 years from now as we grow the foundation of the house out of a, a living organism petri dish kind of approach. We're never going to drive ourselves around. I mean, there's huge things that could make this prediction really hard. But in housing, as we think about the use of stick build on site, that's going to be a big deal to work our way through. In financing of housing, I truly believe that we're going to start to recognize and partner with our, our private organizations and industry to recognize the social determinants and the other impacts that quality housing can get, and we can improve the way in which we finance things through understanding the positive impacts and savings of health outcomes and education outcomes. Um, heck, if we could just eliminate trip and fall by folks uh, your age, Joe, at home, we'd save a whole bunch of money on Medicaid. Um, and, and, and look, we have incented, I, I believe strongly that public policy has an impact, right? Like we incented the development of a nation from east to west, and all of a sudden we had rural communities all over. We, we created a National Highway Act and FHA and so many things, and all of a sudden we had suburbs exploding across the nation. The pendulum swang there. Now we have spent a generation of time investing in the programs of urban growth and this, this amazing concept from Clay Cochran that you guys introduced me to of Metro Pollyanna. We, we've done that. We've affected things. The pendulum will swing. And, and my hope that is in, in just the way that the, you know, the Reverend King would talk about the the, arc, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long and it bends toward justice. I truly hope that that pendulum, with our help, swings not to just, just a rural, but a sense of equity and prosperity across all kinds of ge geographies over the next 20 years. I'm hopeful. I hope you join me in being hopeful as well. Yeah, I would just say when Terry called me about this, I was trying to get to the phone and I fell down twice. You know, it's tough. But, but, but seriously, I. <laughs> to me, and my lawyers will be in touch with yeah. you about this age discrimination. Did it's you one bring of my your, lawyers right there? Did you there. bring your walker? Yeah, I'm Joe, to get did you in, bring your walker? With no, you? I forgot it. That's why I kept falling down. But, but, um, but seriously, to to me, Hack seems well positioned for the next 48 years. So. Please join me in thanking both of these gentlemen here for this. Thank you.